Hey, man, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Behind the camera lens there, we are at our free seminars that we do at Lake Fork Marina, Lake Fork Bass Fish Seminar. We do these free every two weeks. Feel free to join us anytime you want to. We'll be doing the next one two weeks from today, which is two weeks from yesterday if you're watching on the camera. Um, tonight we're going to discuss what, what I want to get into is, is your mentality when the fishing stuff. Because we're dealing with cold front in the fall. We're on the backside of, I mean, the coldest morning of the fall is about to happen tomorrow morning over the weekend. So I really want to break, you know, so we could sit here and talk to you guys about techniques and what techniques to use when it gets tougher. And man, we've done so much of that over the years where we talk about throwing this technique in these conditions and that technique in the, something I don't think that we discuss near enough is your mental game. Because that is more important in my opinion. I think Cord would agree with me. Your mental aspects of your fishing game are way more important than, uh, than, than the baits and techniques that you choose to fish with. There's always a lot of different baits they can work, but if your mental game ain't right, none of them are going to work. So we're going to discuss dealing with tough conditions in the fall, some of the toughest fishing days of the year, and how to get your mind right to keep you on track when it's kind of that grind time, which is what we're experiencing right now this weekend. So I want to break that down. Before we get into all that, though, Cordy, would you mind stepping out for me? Let me yeah. bring Vic. Come on up here. I want to bring Vic Pearsall in here because two weeks ago, was it two, two weekends ago? Two weekends. Two weeks ago, Vic went to Richland Chambers to fish uh, the championship of the Victory Tournament Series, mm -hmm. the Victory Victory yeah, Series Victory that series. runs out of here and some other lakes around here, Ray Hubbard and stuff like that. And, uh, he went to fish the championship for that deal at Richland Chambers, a lake he'd never been to. And even though they didn't have a good finish in the tournament, Vic did something pretty special, especially considering what time of year we're in. You just don't hear of a lot of – not very many fish this size get caught, but Vic, how big you caught a what? Uh, it was 1108 on the scale when we caught the fish, and uh, we had it in the boat probably 20 minutes before we decided we're going to get out of this wind off this hump that we're fishing on and go to the to the weigh-in. And uh, when we were headed back to the boat ramp, I told Cody, I said, "Hey, check on that fish, make sure she's still upright." And uh, he goes up and the live well, and there's about an eight inch shad that the fish threw up. Oh, really? In the live well, and I was about like, a half a pound of shad half, there. Half a pound of shad, yeah, because we uh we went straight from there. It's probably about a 15 minute ride back to the to the weigh in. We got there and went ahead and weighed the fish in early, and it weighed 10 nine. 10 on nine. Their scale. So 11 pounder, one way or the other, about 11 pounder. Um, in fall, before the fall feed has really gone through its cycle and the fish is fattened up for the winter man that's uh <laughs> that's an impressive feat and to do it on a lake you never been on you never been on that lake didn't know nothing about it you and cody were calling me asking me if i knew how to run the lake and i'm like dude i ain't never been there and they're like, <laughs> yeah. they're like we ain't never been there either and i'm like well i don't know what to tell you hey if you don't see wood it's all good let's yeah. get it baby <laughs> didn't know how to run it never pre-fished it nothing, nothing. so no. no experience on that lake so Tell me a little bit about how you guys came about, stumbled into catching this big fish. How'd that, how'd that go down? Well, we had, uh, we had found a creek that we were fishing in that, that we had heard people say, yeah, just fish up in the rivers. And uh, so the first two days that we fished, we trolled back off and the way back and back of these creeks fished our way out. And um, one spot that we found was like a washout pond on the side of where this creek was. And we fished in there and caught a few fish, missed a few fish we shouldn't have. And uh, that Sunday, I told Cody, I said, hey, if, if we can't get a few fish to bust off here, let's go just try another place on the lake. And uh, we caught one keeper that we had. It was about four pounds. And then we missed a couple on frogs right up against the bank. And uh, Cody's like, well, I found another boat ramp. Let's go try this ramp. We get to the ramp. Couldn't even put the boat in because the lake was so low. And uh, come on in over here, brother. We got plenty of chairs yeah, left. Come here, grab this one right here if you want it. Yep. Here, go ahead. And uh, we couldn't put the boat in, so we loaded the boat back up, went to another spot, and uh, the wind was blowing right across this point, and there was a big pocket right where the boat ramp was. And I told Cody, I said, Well, let's go fish over here and we'll fish these pads around. Because everybody was saying, you found pads, you found grass, and we're like, yeah, we don't know where y'all are, but this is what we found. Because y'all don't know the lake. No, we didn't. So to you, you're like, the whole lake has pads and grass, and they're like, this lake ain't got no pads yeah, and grass. Yeah, and we you're like, hell it don't. We <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, the the wind was coming in on this point, and I was using my, my live scope, my 360, and I was seeing shad everywhere, and I was like, man, there's some fish that's hanging off these shad. Let's, let's back off a little bit, see if we can get them to bite. And... Uh, 
the live scope kept seeing shad everywhere. Everywhere I scanned, I see shad and didn't see no bass, didn't see nothing. And uh, I told Cody, I said, hey, there's a couple spots right there on the 360 on the edge of the pads. And uh, I picked up my my shaky head. I was using a little 3 8 ounce shaky head. and uh, Six cent shaky head, I'm sure. The swing shaker. The swing shaker. Yeah. There you go. And uh, had a, what was it? It was a green pumpkin candy Cinco with the yellow tip on it. Okay. And uh, just casted it out there towards one of those marks that I seen on the 360. And uh, I didn't drag it, but probably eight inches. And that fish just inhaled it. So this was a deal where y'all are fishing pad. You saw a mark on 360. So this 360 actually... Really, it's the only reason it you even threw it there. It's the yeah. only reason you even threw it. Yeah. And that's what 360, if you're wondering about electronics and like how valuable they are, Humbird 360 puts bonus fish, what I call bonus fish, mm -hmm. in your boat almost every day once you kind of learn how to pay attention to it the right amount. Like if you're really paying attention to it, you'll be fishing along and you're fishing this over here and then there's a big lay down over here and you make a flip and you just catch one. Yeah. Like you'll get bonus fish and that, so this 11 pounder is what I would call a 360 bonus fish. Oh yeah, it was a bonus fish. For just sure. a, you saw a mark on 360 fishing the pad line, fire shake it out there. Now we got an 11 yeah. pounder in the boat. Man, shaky head is about as good a bait just to get bites as any. Mm -hmm. It's my confidence. Like if I've got to slow down when it's tough, I would rather throw a shaky head than a drop shot myself. Mm -hmm. And a shaky head is just a bait that when I gotta just, when I've got no clue, and I've just got to go, all right, we're going to have to slow way down. We're just going to have to grind. I'm reaching for a quarter ounce, a three-eighths ounce shaky head yeah. with, with a straight tail worm of some kind. And, that, and that's pretty much what we did when yeah. we changed spots. We, it's like what you're what you're talking about. I got you know, nothing. I got to just try to get bites. Yeah, yeah. we, we got to slow down. We got to try to get some bites. We're just trying to finish filling that limit, and yeah. she come up, and she hit it. Yeah. And, we fought her for, I fought her for a little bit, backed my drag all the way off so she wasn't going to run from me. Yeah. And she took two little runs, and then when I got her to the boat, Cody had the net right there, and he went to net her, and he grunted when he picked up the fish. So I knew it had it was been good. a good fish. And Cody he was is like, the best net man, because he netted my 11 pounder good. earlier this yes. year. Yes. <laughs> yes. So he'll say he's Good luck, Charm. Yeah, like you want to partner up with Cody Mays. Like if you're looking for a guide, you want to hire Cody Mays. If you're looking for a tournament partner, you want to get Cody Mays as your tournament partner. He nets giants. Yeah. That's what he does. I mean, he can't catch fish, but he will net them. He can net them. He can net them. Like, well, like my son, my oldest son, Ty, when he was about five years old, we, we were out here fishing, and I had a guide trip the next morning. I was out here one evening just looking for bed fish, and I let him catch a couple, like a couple three pounders and he caught, actually caught a five pounder the week before he turned five years old so that was a big deal oh, yeah. and after he caught that one it kind of the fight whooped him a little bit to be honest with you and he was like dad i don't even want to catch no more <laughs> and i was like i was like what do you mean you don't want to catch him he goes well i do want to catch him but i want to catch him with the net like he wanted me to catch him and he'll just net him, just net him. Yeah. so that's maze he wants to catch him he just wants to catch him with the net yeah, he, he yeah. Net him. i'll tell you that story to tell you this story right yeah that exactly. did. Hey, and I know we've uh, we've introduced a lot of new guides over the last year, and there's always – it's nothing out of the ordinary for Lake Fork. There's always new guys coming in starting guide businesses, and some of the older ones are going out and doing something else, taking taking a different road in life because guiding is definitely not for everybody, and, and so I understand when guys leave. Cody started guiding this last year. Corb, we've introduced y'all too, started guiding this last year. And now – Vic, who I've known for a long time, and Vic, how long have you been fishing Lake Fork? Uh, I started fishing Lake Fork when I was in high school. My mom used to bring me out here, and that was probably around 91. Yeah, so you've got 30, about 30 years of experience on Lake Fork, and, uh, and Vic's actually started, was thinking about starting and actually had started the guy business before all this craziness with the 11-pounder happened, so uh, this has just been the first time I've had an opportunity to introduce him. He is a good friend of mine. Uh, and I can fully put my stamp approval on him. I know him well. I fish with him. I've talked fishing with him almost every week for years now. And uh, I have no problem recommending Vic as a Lake Fork guide, especially with all that experience behind him. So, uh, And you can book a trip with Vic or any of these guys at yourlakeforkguide.com. Mm -hmm. So we can all operate out of that deal. If you're looking for a guide, we can get you set up with one. But um, Vic's starting a guide now. So if you guys want Vic's a fun dude to hang out with. If you, if you like, well, I don't know. How do I say this, Vic? Vic's a really great guy to hang out with as long as you see things the same way he does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, fortunately for most of us fishermen, we see it's things that way. Not. We'll just say he was raised very far right. Very far. He was raised very right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was right. 
No liberals in Vicks boat, guys. No. You don't want to be a liberal in Vicks <laughs> Or my boat, for that <laughs> matter. Your boat. Yeah. No liberals. <laughs> There's 10 seconds in liberal tears. You can't book a guy trip with us. Go cry about it, liberals. Yeah. <laughs> no liberals on a boat. That's right. Red flags only. Well, man, congratulations on the 11-pounder. And uh, best of luck with your guy business. I know you'll do well, man. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for telling the story, buddy. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it. Mr. Cord, come on back up here with me, son. We were playing video games with Vic's kids. You were playing? <laughs> Hopefully they were fishing games. I don't know. I don't know. He's shooting a laser beam or something. <laughs> Probably liberals. <laughs> Is there any liberals in the crowd tonight? We didn't hurt anybody's feelings, did we? There's <laughs> probably something behind that camera. I'll get some nasty comments, I'm sure. I always do. So the mentality when it's tough, and I want to do this with Cord because Cord fishes a lot of tournaments all across the country uh, and faces different conditions. And just came off a very difficult tournament at Lake Washita with very difficult conditions. So so I thought Cord would be a good guy just from his experience fishing all over really the United States to some yeah. degree and fishing against some very tough competition in the BFLs and things such as that. Um, man, it's a, uh, it's a hard one to teach. This is a hard discussion to sit here and have and teach you guys how to adopt the right mentality when it's difficult. And here's from my perspective, my personal perspective, what happens to me. I'm spoiled because I fish so often and I fish maybe the greatest, probably the greatest trophy bass lake that's ever existed. And when that one's tough, I've got dozens of other lakes right around me that I can go to that are usually going to be fishing pretty good. So fortunately for me, I don't have to deal with every lake's fishing tough. Every option I have today is tough. I just don't have to deal with that very much. So what happens for me is I get so locked into this mentality of if it's not the deal, I don't want to do it. Like if it's not going to catch 20, 25, 30 pound bags, I don't want to mess with it. Like I'm not going to fish the right way to grind it out sometimes when it's tough because I get so locked into, well, this is okay. We're getting a couple bites, but we need to do this. And, and we got to go figure this deal out. Like, okay, we can run down the bank and catch some three pounders, but we need to go to that brush pile and catch five and six pounders. You know what I mean? And so I always fish the way where I'm trying to find the deal because I'm a fishing guy or I'm filming a video and I'm trying to put the biggest five fish in the boat every day. That's, that's how I'm built. That's what I try to do. And because of the situation that I'm in, like I said, where I get to fish good, good fishing situations most of the time, I get locked into looking for that. And I just, I don't, do a very good job myself it's a flaw in my game when i go out there tomorrow and every lake in this area is going to be tough tomorrow i even if you go to a power plant lake guys that water temp on any lake has dropped probably 10 degrees in the last four or five days and it's going to keep dropping through the weekend because the highs are going to be 60 and the water temp is above 60. so the highs are sick the highs or 60 and the water temps above that, that water temps got nowhere to go but fall. It's gonna fall when it's 33 tonight and it's gonna keep falling tomorrow because it ain't gonna get above 60. So this water temps is just a steady decline. That's gonna shock those fish and make them reluctant to bite. I don't care what situation they're in, they're gonna be very reluctant to bite. And in those situations, what you really need to do is you need to have some confidence in yourself even when you don't have any right to. Like you're not getting any bites, but you gotta have confidence in yourself and you have confidence in your knowledge that you need to slow down and you need to go finesse. That's really what you need to do. You need to pick up a drop shot. You need to pick up a wacky worm. Uh, you need to pick up, give me something else, a jerk bait. You need to pick up things that are, that are good finesse, cold water techniques that you can fish really, really slow. And that takes a lot of confidence from your end on being in the right area. You have to, whether you're in the right area or not, you gotta believe you are. Because the only way to fish those baits, the right way to get bit on them is to have confidence there's fish in that area and fish slow enough. It's something that I'm terrible at. I mean, I'm absolutely probably the worst guy you can fish with to fish that way. I, 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 told, I told him just the other day we were out and we were struggling and I said, man, I said, what we need to do is pick up that wacky worm, but I'm not going to fish it slow enough to do it, so I'm just not going to do it. Like, I, you know what, that's what I told you. I said, <laughs> I'm not going to fish that slow. Like, I'll pick up a wacky worm, and I like a wacky worm, and I'll be confident with a wacky worm, but I know the mentality I'm in right now, I'm still trying to find a better bite, and I'm not going to fish that bait the way it needs to be fished, so I'm not going to get bit on it. And that's what you got to get your mind right. This is a flaw in my game that I noticed this week because it got tough. Other than Tuesday. Tuesday, we, we didn't catch any big ones. We caught like 30-something fish Tuesday. Okay, but that was before. I mean, that was kind of the in-between right before the next cold front deal. It was the best day of the week. But... Anyways, 
I noticed this flaw in my game this week, so that's why I wanted to talk about it with you guys. And really, for me, what I think we need to be doing in these situations, like if I'm going out tomorrow, what I need to be doing is going to an area. I've been fishing Lake Fork a ton, so I know where there's some fish, where fish have been. I need to break that area down, see where those fish find the nearest, deepest water they might pull back to. And I need to go over there and get that quarter ounce shaky head, that eighth ounce shaky head, and get that finesse jig and get that drop shot. And I need to go do what I know I need to do, force myself to just go fishing. Here's my area. We're just going to go fishing. We're not going to have any preconceived notions. We're going to go real slow. We're going to take our time. We're going to understand the fish aren't going to bite that good. And we're going to pick everything apart till we figure out a bite or two. And then we're going to really zero in on that and go even that much slower on those spots. If it's a stump on a creek, creek channel bend, fine, we're going to run that. If it's outside edge of grass, we're going to run that. Whatever it may be, we're going to slow down till we get a couple bites. And then we're just going to hone in and focus and take or daggum time and be confident even when you don't have any right to be um, that that's what I think needs to be done that's what I also am terrible at doing Cord you take this situation I mean you were just at Lake Washington it was tough tough so so you take this situation to, to different tournaments all over the place you go to turnover situations you go to post frontal situations all that what, what's your what's your take on the mentality situation here for, for tough fishing Nine times out of ten, you just got to know going into it. Like, like when I'm doing all my homework, research, you know, I've talked about in the past, and just knowing, like, you look at the weather, and I'm like, you know what? Practice is going to suck. Like, you know, like, in practice, I may fish for three days and get two bites. I may get three bites. I highly doubt I'm going to get 10 or 12 bites. If I do, then something's, you know, really, really right. So it's like you already know, like, to not expect to go get bit every – wood pile you flip or whatever and just knowing just trying to keep that hyper focus mentality and it's tough it takes time like i'm not gonna sit here and tell you that like one yeah this out. is probably the hardest thing to do in fishing oh yeah like and like i'm not even gonna lie like it took me a long time you know like i'd be like oh man like i caught one off a stump you know in practice first day of practice that means every stump i flip i'm gonna catch one you can flip 500 stumps you ain't gonna get bit but then that 501st one, you might get bit. And it's just, if you can't keep the hyper-focus hyper focus kind of mentality, you'll get to a point about lunchtime, you know, like, yeah, that morning vibe, you'll kind of get it. But then you'll get to a point to where you're just, you're in la-la land. You feel like a zombie, you know, like you're not paying attention. Then that's when you mess up. And about the time it starts to slip away and you're just going through the motions, but like, damn, weigh-ins in three hours. I ain't got bit in four hours. And then all of a sudden your line goes, boom, and you ain't paying attention, and he runs off with it, and you set the hook, and it's gone. And then you're like, okay, well, never mind. I have zero chance now. Yeah. So it's, And it just takes time. you know. Like it, it took me a long time to get to that point, but fishing enough tournaments and traveling and just – and especially like going to those lakes knowing like Lake Washita, for example, it's a – I would say almost predominantly spotted bass, and there's a really good largemouth population – but everybody can catch 12 inch spots and trying to find that better bite, you know, knowing, especially after I went to practice, you know, and I, I pre practice, I fished for three days and got two keeper bites. Yeah. Wow. You know, and it's just, and that's fishing anything from 35, 40 foot deep to top water from one in the lake to another and got two keeper well, bites. Well, I know you, you spent some time in zero foot, I know. Yeah. You Oklahoma kid, and you like to get up in the dirt a little bit. I know. Hey, that's why you know. Whenever the deep bite didn't work out, I was like, I'm gonna run up the creek. You know, fall time. Yeah. You know that, and it, I, you know, adverse conditions. Lake Washita right now is, and it may be, it may be a new record now since I haven't been there in like two weeks. Uh, it was like eight inches from being the lowest it's ever been since I impounded the lake, and God knows when it was ten and a half foot low and standing timber everywhere there's no boat lanes there's no way to nowhere there was one guy sunk his boat in practice you know so i mean it's dangerous you don't know what you're doing you know it's and it's gin clear water you can see 20 foot it's usually loaded with grass but all the grass is dead laying up on the bank Probably because lake's low yeah and then everywhere if you don't have a map and you go to lake washita you're gonna get lost everything looks the same you can drive (laughs) you can literally drive around the corner and spin around three times you wouldn't know where you took off from mm. it, i mean you don't know 
and everything looks the same. Every bank, every point, every wall looks the identical same. So it's a lot to take in and adjust to. Oh, yeah. I mean, like you pull up and you're thinking like, man, I'm going to go fish grass. I've seen this YouTube yeah. video. It's got hydro and you show up and as far as you can see, it's nothing but pea gravel and rock. Yeah. And there ain't no grass and, you know, fall time already. There's bait everywhere and half the places you might want to fish you can't hardly get to unless you're going to troll and motor a half mile back in just because the stumps are so so thick so just knowing that it's just going to be you're going to get your butt kicked yeah. is you know the deal you know specifically talking about these fall conditions your know, fall is such a weird deal fall is the biggest roller coaster of the whole year when it comes to bass fishing it's Man, when it when it's right in the fall, it's it's literally the best bite you'll you'll have all year. I mean, as far especially as far as numbers of fish go, I mean, you can catch bigger numbers in the fall. You can any time of year. You can also have the worst fishing days of the year mm -hmm. in the fall, and sometimes the day after the best day. I mean, oftentimes because right before the front comes in, been on a warming trend, boy, you'll bust them that day. Front blows in overnight. The next day we're post frontal and thirty degree. You won't catch nothing, you know. So sometimes day to day it can just be such a roller coaster in the fall and. And that's what happens is these fish are only here to feed. The only thing they're going to do this time of year is feed. They're going to move around a lot. We've talked about that at length. Even on the, the fish tracking survey that Tex Parks and Wildlife did, they said that the fish move around more in the fall, even then in the springtime when they move to spawn. They move randomly and all over the place in the fall a whole bunch compared to the rest of the year. So you've already got that factor of the movement of the fish being somewhat random and often. And then the changing weather conditions that we deal with too. And so with those fish only being there to feed and moving around a lot with the shad, you get those warming trends or, or those stable to warming trends and those fish get locked into a certain area where those bait fish kind of start piling up. They feed, 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 and sometimes you can get them in the same area for a little while when they're doing that. And then all of a sudden a cold front blows in and knocks those shad back out of the back of that creek and pulls them out to the mouth or pulls them to the middle and they suspend over a creek or who knows where the shad go at times because they're kind of random in their movements for sure. <coughs> and then those bass, not only do they not bite, but they also move on you. And that's what makes, to me, in my opinion, tomorrow, one of the, and today for that matter, one of the toughest fishing days of the year. It's gonna be. It doesn't matter if you go to Power Plant Lake, it doesn't matter where if you go to Lake of the Pines, Palestine, Fork, it doesn't matter what lake you go to. These conditions on these post frontal days in the fall are some of the toughest you're ever going to face. And you're going to have to understand you're probably not going to catch as big a fish on those post frontal days. You're going to catch smaller fish usually, and you're going to have to finesse them. Um, I know I'm kind of repeating myself from earlier, but, but I just kind of want that's why those days get so tough. <coughs> fish are already moving a bunch, and then right about the time they get settled in on something, boom, the weather hits them in the mouth, and they're they gone. And then not only are they gone, you've got to refine them, but when you do find them, not very many of them, if any, are going to bite. So it makes for a very difficult situation. To me, the fall is one of the best times. It's a good, it's a good learning season. Very much so. Very good. Like if you can do it, that and to me, it's I like the fall. And most people are like, you're retarded. I'm like, no, no, I love, I love fishing the fall. I mean, I like it to where I can like put my hoodie on yeah. and go in the morning, fish your top waters, but fish are everywhere. So. And it's good to like keep notes. I know guys that like keep like a journal type deal, notes in your phone. Let me let me let me let me interrupt you there. Yeah. Because I don't know, and you can disagree with me if you want to here. I don't think fish are everywhere in the fall, but I do think they're anywhere. Because the, thing, the okay. thing about fall is they'll get grouped up, and when they get grouped up, then there's parts of the lake that have nothing. Yes. But in fall, they can be absolutely anywhere. Yeah, anywhere. I guess yeah. not not yeah. everywhere. I should right. say anywhere. They right. can be. You can go on the lake right now. I mean, post frontal obviously tougher, but essentially this time of year. You can on a just, good day in the fall. You can just about do anything. Yep. You can go brush pile, shaky head in 30 foot of water. You could go flip what grass you can find right now in six inches of water or yep. anything in between. You can go out to a pond dam in 30 foot. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you can essentially do everything. And then with the way the weather is this time of year, you know, in two days, it might be 85 degrees and we'll all break the flip flops back out. That's right. And then tomorrow morning, you're going to have bibs and a hoodie on. Right. And if, you just put that mentality in your mind. This is the best time of year to do it. Is like, yeah, just like I want to just want to catch five fish. You know, especially if you're like a tournament guy. You know, me, I'm like, all right, I'm, a, I'm just going for. I'm just going fun fishing. But all I want to do is catch five fish. I'm gonna do everything I can yeah. to catch five. I know it's gonna be tough, be brutal. I'm gonna <laughs> fish till three o'clock. I'm just gonna try to catch five, and just I learned and like you really learn to 
follow the fish and make the right decisions, you know, and let the fish tell you what they want, you know, because, you know, you may have a cloudy overcast day, you know, I, I had a guy trip the other day and we ended up, we tried a bunch of different things, we ended up keeping a buzz bait in our hand the majority of the day. We didn't catch a whole lot, we only caught a handful, but they were all pretty decent and that was all, the, I mean, you could That flip. was what you could do. That's all, I mean, that's the only thing they would bite, you know, places where I could flip a dock and then I could take my buzz bait and throw it in there and, and they'd come up and get it. Well, Lake Fork's kind of a unique animal yes. on having the right technique dialed in. Like, Lake Fork's so unique in that aspect of these fish see so many different baits throughout the year, man. They really get honed in on a lot of times when it gets tough, you get one technique and if you're off that technique, yeah, you're just not going to catch them. I mean, that's just kind of how Lake Fork is at times. But that mentality that we're talking about, you know, there's probably some people watching this online. I think you guys that are here in person, most of you guys are probably tournament fishermen. Y'all fish tournaments. No? Yes, sir. This guy doesn't. He doesn't fish any tournament. <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> so if you're just for fun fishing, you're going to be like, dang, I don't even want to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like in these conditions. And I understand. And there's people out there that just go fun fishing. And they may not want to go in these conditions. But if you want to become a better fisherman where you can catch them more consistently, no matter what the conditions are doing, the only way you're going to do that is to get out on those toughest days and figure it out and get that mentality right like we're talking about tonight. Um, that is, I, I love that. And that's one of the big things that told me I needed to do this for a living was the worse the fishing was on me, the worse I wanted to get right back on the water. Like if I had a great day of fishing and I caught them, yeah, I want to go back and do it again tomorrow. At the same time, I also want to go call court and get a drink, sit on the porch and talk about it, yeah. you know. And if I woke up late the next day, oh, well, we caught him yesterday, you know. <laughs> but if I went out there and I zeroed or I one or two and I just struggled my butt off when I didn't think I should or for whatever reason, if I just didn't catch them, like I couldn't hardly get to the house. Like I wanted to turn around and go try to figure them out. And if you have that mentality of wanting to figure them out and not accepting the fact that you can't catch the fish, like if you'll embrace the suck. We say it's in the Marine Corps all the time. I'm sure you said in the Army too. Yeah. Embrace the suck. Yep. Embrace the suck. Hey, the suck is a good thing. When it sucks, it's making you better. Mm -hmm. You hear so many professionals talk about when they have a bad practice, well, I eliminated a bunch of water. Yeah, you did. You got better. And, and they got better. And also, you'll hear almost every professional elite series level guy will tell you their best tournaments come after their worst, worst practices. I mean, almost every one of them will tell you that to a T. And what happens is those guys get into practice, they get locked into something, and then they get like me. And they're like, well, no, I don't want to do this. I want to do that. That's the deal. And then the tournament develops and conditions change, and they don't adapt. And the guys that go out and suck in practice go into day one, and they figure it out as the tournament goes on, they get stronger and stronger. I can tell you that from experience. Mm -hmm. I've literally, like, my two better practices this year, 100% were my two worst finishes I had all year. I had a really good practice at Rayburn in my last one, and I finished 134th, and I had a pretty good practice on Lake Ufala this year in Oklahoma, and I finished 104th. <laughs> the other ones where I fished for three days and caught one or two fish, I caught like three fish at Lake of the Pines this year. I had like a 20 place finish. I only caught one keeper in three days of practice at Grand and I had a fifth place finish. Yeah. You know, so that, that's, if it's because you, you fish more freely, just, yeah. I mean, it's the You've same You've got the thing. right mentality. Yeah, to lose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's essentially, but yeah, like. You've got the right mentality. And that's what, that, that's what we're talking about. I mean, mm -hmm. this mentality deal, hey, forget if you can throw a buzz bait correctly or, or pick the right creek channel, throw a jig in, right? Like that's all important. But none of it is nearly as important as fishing with the right mentality. Having confidence in what you're doing, even when you don't have any reason to, like when you're not getting bit, mm -hmm. still being able to be a confident angler, that is where you become next level. Like that's where you improve your game from, I'm in high school tournaments and I'm, I'm in the bottom half, mm -hmm. time top 10 in. Or I'm fishing a local club trail and I can't cut a check to now I'm competing for angler of the year. Yeah. Or in your case, you know, the better you get at that, you're going to go from I'm here in the BFL to I just won the BFL, and yeah. now I'm moving on to FLW. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and even on the top level, that's what makes it. I mean, you talk to any of those guys, the mentality and the confidence makes so much difference in what you're doing. It, it is unbelievable. And um, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here, but it's, uh, it's a big deal, man. I mean, like, you just put confidence – I mean, like, on those tournaments – you put like your confidence bait in your hand yeah. and you just go grind it out. 
Yeah. Just know that, like, hey, I know this bait will yeah. catch fish. I know it's something that'll get bit. I you, you just got to go put your head down and go do it, you know. Well, that, and like you, like a lot of guys nowadays are simplifying it, you know. And I look at that a lot, you know. Like we listen to like Seth Fighter, you know. So I was just fixing to refer to you know like Seth Fighter this year. He's like I probably fished like ten or twelve baits all year on the Elite Series. Yeah. Like I've listened to three or four of his different podcasts of his AOI deal, and he was like, I pretty yeah. much just like a flipping stick, a square bill, like and a guy, bait. The guys all make fun of him because they're like, we know how to win angle of the year, just don't get too far away from the boat ramp. Yeah, and like, <laughs> and, and like he never <laughs> he made any monster runs. Like <laughs> yeah. he'd, he'd run a half mile down and just be a string of laydowns, and he just He would away, just go fishing, guys, and that's that's the deal. Like Head down, grind, like, all right, I'm going to go catch five today yeah. and just – Go catch five. If That's, it's in your wheelhouse and you're doing something you like to do and you're catching them all, you don't need any of my advice. You don't need anybody's advice for that matter. But when it's not, which is most of the time, for most of it, if, if, it's, most, if it's mostly in your wheelhouse most days, you need to sign up for some big events. Because for most guys, even on top level, it's not in their wheelhouse mm-hmm. most of the time. Like I would say 80 or 90% of the time, it's not in your oh, wheelhouse. God. You have to figure something out and grind a little bit to get something. But just going fishing, and that's such a simple term, but to me what that means is all preconceived thoughts out of your mind, analyze what's in front of you, think about the conditions you're dealing with, and fish appropriately and fish confidently in whatever you're doing. So for tomorrow, post frontal, just like we talked about in the beginning, finesse, go slow. Get you an area you're confident has fish and get to work and just go fishing. And don't worry about not catching them. Ain't nobody else catching them either. You just keep grinding, and you're going to end up catching more than everybody at the end of the day. And that, that's the deal. You know, this is kind of geared towards tournament fishing. So for our, our guy that doesn't tournament fish, this may not be the conversation you may have not wanted to hear hey, tonight. But some but things will still play, like, and something else I'll tell you. It's all about becoming a better fisherman no matter what. We're just talking about it in reference to competing against other guys, right? And don't fill your boat up full of gas, and don't look at the whole map of the lake. Pick one side or the other and stick to it. Yeah. And that's the same like tournament practice. I see guys like, I can't remember who it was. I maybe Matt Lee or one of the Van Dams or something this year. They were like, they went out and he's like, I only put like a half a tank of gas on my boat just so I knew I couldn't go run around. And I had yeah. to keep the troll motor in the water and fish because if I knew I was, had to go it's run hard, here, It's hard to, to catch him. It's hard to catch him at 70. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to catch him at 70 miles an hour. But like, but like even like practice, I don't know how many times I've got strung out to where I got one bite up here in the river and I got a bite 30 miles yeah. down the lake here and then it comes tournament day and you're like I got, I got, oh, I got yeah. three keeper bites in four days one's here one's here and one's here one's clear water one's muddy water and one's kind of in between it, and odds are you could have picked any of the three and just gone fishing and been just as good as you would have picked the one arm or one arm of the lake pick mm-hmm. one section you know like cut the sucker in half it's already pretty much divided in half it's pretty easy yeah. fish the dam this way or the dam that way and yeah, you know, just like stick with it, and yeah, I think eliminating water. I think if you're talking about specifically for tournaments, eliminating water is probably ten times more valuable than finding mm-hmm. fish. Uh, eliminating water to me is so much more important than finding fish. And I think, like when those guys say they had their best tournaments after bad practices, that's what's happening. They're going around and eliminating techniques, eliminating water. They're taking things out of the equation. So now, when day one of the tournament starts. Yeah, they ain't caught nothing, but they know what not to do. Mm-hmm. And they take an area and something they're confident in and they go to work and they just go fishing. And they fish the way they've always known how. The more you fish, sometimes experience and, and knowledge and history works against you in this game as much as anything else will. Um, having all that experience and knowledge and history can be good, but man, a lot of times it's going to bite you in the butt because we're always dealing with ever changing conditions. We're dealing with different bodies of water, different bait species that fish are foraging on so many different puzzle pieces that we're doing in this game that having all that history and trying to make this puzzle piece fit into this new puzzle it ain't gonna work you know what i mean and and so just going fishing and trying to fish like you did in the beginning you know i find myself thinking about that a lot these days now that i've been fishing like four dang near every day for going on five years now and fished it for six years every time i had a chance you know a couple days a week before that uh, I've had so much experience on this lake that it's hard for me to not go, well, early March, they're going to be right over there, right? But when I first started, I didn't know that. So how did I find that they were right there in early March? Just fished. By looking at the map and thinking about where they should be based on conditions for that day and the time of year. Yeah. And then fishing the baits that I had confidence in in those areas. 
that's how I found those fish that I relied on for three or four or five or seven years at times. They would show up in early March. Well, now they don't. So what do I need to do? I need to go back to the beginning and analyze that map and think about the conditions and just go fishing and find some new areas that were like that. That's what I've got to do. Mm -hmm. And so as I've gotten on in my time here at Lake Fork, I've really found myself thinking about that a lot of let's just start over, man. Let's start over and let's take all this knowledge that you've gained. Yeah, there's some things that I've learned over the years, God and every day that are going to help. But let's go back to the basics of understanding seasonal patterns, understanding the types of cover and structure they should be in for that time of year, and let's find new ones. Quit going off. History. Jimmy Jack caught them over here the other day, and I caught them over there last year, and they, those fish always pull in the glade in October. No, the hell they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> Maybe they do, but they're out on the other side of glade. Well, that's a big old bay, dude. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you can really screw yourself if you're not open-minded. And uh, it, it's just, you're kind of getting a little bit of therapy session from me right now, right? Because one of the hardest things that i found about guiding is you don't get the practice. There are no days without pressure to put fish in the boat. I'm either guiding or I'm filming 99 and a half days out of 100. Like, if I'm on the water, I've got to put fish in the boat. So I don't have a day where I can just go, you know what, screw what I know, let's go do this. So over the years, you get into that history deal. And I see a lot of the most veteran guides on this lake. And you'll know which ones because they're the ones that go, man, Lake Fork just ain't what it used to be. No, them five points that you fish every June ain't what they used to be. And I'm not saying Lake Fork is what it was in the 90s. I get that. Like, that is a real thing, right? Yeah. The lake's not at its peak anymore. Watch any Elite Series event that comes. It's still the best trophy bass lake in the country, right? There's a reason it got rated number one this year. Like, yeah. the, when those Elite Series guys start coming here, it really opens your eyes. You get dudes that are real good, real experienced from all over the country. They come here and look at different things, see them differently than all of us have always fished it do, and all of a sudden it pops out a 100-pound bag no matter what the conditions are. Prime example is Brandon Cobb with that jerk bait because nobody before that fished a jerk bait. Threw a jerk bait on, on them shallow points. Yeah. Yeah, nobody. Like, nobody. nobody. Did that. Or, I mean, there were so many things in that one event alone. Okay. Right. In that one event alone, there were so many things that happened. Um, and that was, what's that guy's name? Pipkins. Chad Pipkins. Oh, yeah. The first day or two, first, the first two days, He's like fishing that round point in Dale. It kind of has a creek near it, but not really a big creek, not a big drop off right there. It's kind of silted in. And he's just fishing, finding fish off of this old round point where they're moving in and out of that creek on the spawn. Listen, guys, I'm out here every day. Nobody ever fished there. Now, I heard some guys go, God dang, Pipkins, expose that area. I've been fishing for years. Hold up. I've driven by there every day going back to sight fishing. I ain't seen you in there yet. <laughs> like, nobody fishes that area. And I mean, I was literally at that time had been sight fishing for a month straight within sight of where he was fishing. Nobody was on that. It's just something that he saw from his experience and his life experience because he just showed up with a new set of eyes and just went fishing, right? Same thing we all need to do. If you find yourself and you've been fishing a lake for a long time or you find yourself getting stuck on one technique or one thought process of something you should do, man, think back to when you started. And when you're reading every Bassmaster article, when you're watching every Hank Parker episode and, and doing all these things that we've always, and now, boy, the options are unlimited for advice, right, with social media. YouTube. There's so many, almost every pro angler's giving you advice on seasonal patterns and techniques. And man, absorb as much of that information as you can, especially about seasonal patterns and structures and, you know, big, big topics like that. And then just go fishing. Just find, look on the map. I don't know how many times I'm going to say go fishing tonight. But <laughs> it's like Lee saying legit on that pocket. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know if y'all watched the uh, Ike and Ellie episode a few months ago with Lee, Lee Livesey and Caleb Summerall. But I, I promise you, you can make the best drinking game in the world if you took a shot every time Lee Livesey said legit, legit. on that podcast. <laughs> I don't th we I were don't, cracking I up listening to that. I don't, I don't think we need to promote shots. Cause they ain't gonna make it through the first like no, five like minutes. No, like a shot, a shot of beer. Oh yeah, like one shot of beer. Shot, yeah, it's yeah. A beer drinking. Like, like one yeah. sip of beer. Yeah, yeah. If you do a whiskey, you ain't getting through thirty minutes, dude. Right. No, no, it's legit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was legit. <laughs> I mean, legitimately, you're not making it through whiskey. No. no. Uh. Uh. <laughs> well, do y'all have any questions about this topic? I know it's a big topic. It's kind of a hard one to get your head around. Are we making any sense tonight? Yeah, y'all are making complete sense because. Uh, 
back in the day whenever I first started fishing tournaments, I was fishing predominantly out here. I pre fished a lot, you know, and then I'd go do, oh man, I caught him doing this, go there, tournament day, and yeah. it's done. So then you spend half a day doing what worked, and then you only got half a day to yeah. find them. Well, I started doing it. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to not even pre fish and just launch the boat and go fish. And I had, uh, in 2020, I had uh, the best, like, tournament standings I've ever had. Production, yeah. Yeah, production. So yeah, I think, so what happens in the... Especially for one-day events, yeah. I feel like that's... So what happens in the pre-fishing deal, if you if you go out in, pre, in practice for a tournament, for a one-day event, and you really get on them, and there's no off-limits period, like you're on them the couple days before the tournament starts, okay... If that pattern holds up, that's great. If you, I mean, yeah. if you if you go out and you find the deal in practice for a one-day event, that's great. For a multi-day event, or if you have five days off limits, which a lot of places, a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of events do. Most most of the amateur level trails will have five days off limits. Mm -hmm. What happens is when you go out and you practice, and you practice to catch fish and see find fish instead of find structure or eliminate water. When when you go out and you find fish. Whatever you find, good, bad, or indifferent, you're going with that. Right. Even if it's a week later, like you're going to go with that. And I think uh, you shouldn't, but most right. of us, I did it at Rayburn this year. When I went to fish bass champs, there's a five-day off-limits period. I'm like, well, I'm going to throw a chatterbait in that grass. And I went out there and finished 90-something. <laughs> Throwing that chatterbait in that grass, you know? I mean, it's a, it's a hard deal to accept if you go out and practice and you catch some good fish. Yeah to not go pursue those fish. And that's why those guys say that their best practices are their worst tournaments, worst practice, mm -hmm. best tournaments, right? It happens to everybody. You wanna know how many times I've scrapped my game plan like for a one day tournament, mm -hmm. went pre-fish two, three days, and something happened overnight, or the clouds disappear, temperature dropped 15 degrees more in the tournament, and I'd be like, no, I'm not going to do that. Or I'd do it for like 45 minutes and be like, this ain't the deal. And then reach in and have to retie something else on. And that ended up being the deal. Like, I threw a chatterbait in the grass. Uh, by the time I met you and all that, that, yeah. was, that was like my That's deal. That's when we met when I was pre fishing for that first Rayburn event. Yeah. And like, I was like, going to throw that old fire crawl, Rayburn red, half ounce chatterbait in the grass. And I was catching some pretty good ones. Then he comes to me next day after the tournament. He's like, I threw a jerk bait. I'm like, what, 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 what? Hold on. I yeah. ain't throwing a jerk bait all week. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was a deal. I just like got up and because all practice was a little more cloudier, had a little bit of rain off and on. You know, this, I think January and in March was like kind of the same conditions. Water temp surprisingly never changed between January and yeah. March. Got a little bit colder in the middle of February for <laughs> yeah. some reason. I don't know. Still had 50 degree water temp January and March. But uh, yeah, like that morning the tournament took off, throw my chatter bait, and I'm like, it was like light, medium winds, like 10, 15 mile an hour winds, and it was bluebird not caught in the sky, and I'm like, I said, I'm feel chatterbaity to me. I'm like, this is like, I like reach down, I tie on a, a, a little short jerk bait, like one of the smaller ones, like a OG, like Strike King KVD jerk bait that I had, the popping it through the grass. And the first one I caught was like four and a half pounds. It's like, huh. And I'm like watching my 360 and like fishing the grass line and finding that grass. It's like in 10 foot of water, but only grows up to about six, seven foot tall. And I'm just ripping that, just diving about three or five foot, pop down and then. Rip it through the grass, pop it a couple times, rip it through the grass, and they were just chomping on it. But they wouldn't buy the trap, they wouldn't buy nothing else. So yeah. something that jerk bait darting back and forth, and then I was like, okay, you know, I cash a check and I come back later. I well, and you, if I remember correctly, you actually lost a real big one that if you would have landed would have put you on up there. Yeah. So when we now was, you wouldn't have messed with Derek Mundy, whatever. That no, no. <laughs> that crazy one was there. Okay, so January, no one had a chance at Monday or whatever yeah. on that deal. That one was a fire crawl chatterbait deal. That okay, one. okay. So this is the March when you did the jerkbait. Okay, so, gotcha. yeah, so March I went back and I, I went into practice and it was like same conditions it was in January. And I'm like, I threw like a methylate wacky worm and a fire crawl chatterbait and everything looks the same. Well, I went back to my same areas. We did have some rain and it blew out a bunch of the areas I was fishing. And yep. I'm like, I fished around, fished around, and I'm like, well, I'll throw a spinner bait. I'll do some other things. And I fished all the muddy water. And then finally I was like, well, this whole half of the lake is dead to me. So now I'm only going to fish yeah. this half of the lake. Yeah, because, well, in, in January, me and you were kind of trying to stay out of the crowd. We yeah. both had the same thought process yep. on that. And we were on kind of that eastern arm of Rayburn. But it did. It got blown out for that March yeah, event. And I did, too. I went and punted and went way, oh. way left in March as well. Yeah. yeah, and then, like, we come back in March, and we had a back-to-back. -back. There were 
still single day events where we fish two days in a row kind of deal and i finally found some clean water was catching them in the grass and that's when i pulled out my jerkbait deal and went to wearing them out and i was like okay and i did that two days in a row and casting checks both ways i mean i didn't first day i did have one on a chatterbait that was like four and a half pounds that i lost that really hurt me and then i had one on a jerkbait that was like Somewhere between six and seven pounds. Yeah, that's the one I remember you telling me. Like right up to and the that boat. One, that one would have, if we were looking at the way your, your your bag was, that one would have shot you way up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The weights got really, really tight in that March tournament. And both of those fish, the four pounder one day and the six pounder the other, were the difference between yeah. like a solid 40s, like where I ended up, to like a almost a top 10 just with yeah. those one fish each day. So it was pretty brutal. Hurt your feelings, as they say. Yeah. And don't vote flip them in a tournament. That's all the only way I know, dog. Well, if you do it, you better. But I don't throw a jerk bait very much in little bit treble hooks. Yeah. You know? <laughs> if you do, you better put on some super stout hooks on that jerk bait. Because <laughs> it will break your heart when you yeah. try to boat flip one. That's right. Any questions? Anything else? All right. I guess we can roll on out of here. Y'all ready to go eat? Yeah. Who who already ate? Who's going to eat? I'm going. Going to eat. Y'all already eat? I guess I have one question real quick. Yeah. So you go to a place, either you haven't been there in a long time or what have you. And sure. It's terrible, terrible conditions, like we're saying. Mm -hmm. Like, would it not be a decent plan to go out and throw some reaction baits and get like a bite in an area yeah. and then go yeah. through there and be like, okay, I got a bite. Now I'm confident enough I can slow down. And right. I have a little more confidence uh, to... That I have fish here. Be slow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. And that that's something you have to uh, weigh and make your own decisions on, really, in the, at the end of the day. But, yeah, I mean, when you go to a place you don't know nothing about and you're trying to find fish, it's going to be a lot easier for you to cover water fishing something that's faster. What I would tell you is if I'm going to do that, I'm going to downsize my moving baits, okay? So if i got tough conditions like tomorrow, mm -hmm. if I'm going to name a lake in Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma? Yeah. The Arkansas River. Ten killer. Ten killer. Okay, I don't even uh, know what you're talking about, River Fish. Man, Arkansas mud hole. River? I ain't going there. That's a mud hole. Man, it's, uh, like, <laughs> it's like half as good as the Sabine. Let's put it that way. Okay, we're not going there. <laughs> so, ten killer. And I know nothing about ten killer. I really don't. I mean, I'm assuming it's Oklahoma. It's kind of, that's the northeast part of Oklahoma? Yeah, you just got to so call gonna me. Be, I know. It's going to be like the... rocky and deeper water, more clear water? Yes. It okay. Is actually one of the cleaner okay, so what I'm going to do in that situation in the fall, I'm going to, seasonal patterns, Let's just say I have to be shallow, right? Mm -hmm. So, because this is easier for me to explain this if I get to be shallow. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but what I'm going to do is instead of throwing a uh, swim bait, chatter bait, bigger spinner bait, stuff like that, I'm going to downsize my reaction baits. So I'm going to go to a quarter ounce trap and fish it slower right. and more of a finesse wiggle. I'm going to go to a smaller jerk bait. I'm going to go and fish it. I might fish it fast, but I'll have some pause in there, but I might fish it fast, just cover water with a jerk bait. But I'm going to go to a spinner bait and go downsize. Mm -hmm. Down the quarter ounce spinner bait, smaller blades. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to give me some ability to cover water while still being more of a finesse presentation. And I'm going to fully understand that I'm having to cover water too fast for my conditions. And when I get a bite, I need to analyze where that bite came from, be paying real close attention, and I need to really break that area down with my drop shot, with my whatever, whatever. shaky head, yeah, finesse jig, whatever. So. Uh, that would be my answer to you on any lake. If it's a grass, let's say we're going to Gunnersville. Boy, that quarter ounce trap's going to play real good, that little spinner bait. You know, that type of stuff's going to play real good. Maybe a flat sided square bill on 10 killer might be my deal, right? If I'm fishing shallow. Now, if I've got to go deeper, it becomes tougher to do because deeper water winding baits to cover water with in deeper water, if I want to fish faster in deeper water, it's very difficult to find ones that you can give. About the only thing you can do that is half of a finesse presentation is an Alabama rig, and it's not very fast. Uh, you know, if I'm throwing a deep diving crankbait or a, a swim bait on a jig head, I'm going to have to fish it pretty fast. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to fish it pretty big. I'm sorry, I shouldn't yeah. say fast. I'm going to have to fish it pretty big. Uh, swim bait on a jig head, it's going to have a big old hook on it, it's got a big head. Um, otherwise, I'm going to be dragging something out deep, you know. And if I'm going to drag something, well, in those conditions, I've got to stay at each spot for a long time. It's going to take my ability to weigh to cover water fast because to get bites in tough conditions, you've got to slow down. So, so if I'm dragging something, I'm really 
in offshore, I'm more of a dragger than I am a winder. It's funny because I'm a winder. I mean, I'm a big time winder. I want to wind everything, everything, everything. And then when I go out deep, I'm like, give me a football jig, give me a Carolina rig. You know, I'm more of a dragger out deep, a big 10 inch worm. That's what I want to fish, big magnum shaky head, stuff like that. So uh, it's just kind of a weird dichotomy of me as a fisherman. It's, it's, I'm this way up shallow and then I'm this way out deep. Got a question. Well, yes, sir. I'm, I'm from New Fall in Oklahoma, so yes, I sir. Don't know anything about this. Yes, sir. Uh, out of curiosity, is the lake level has it been fairly constant, or is it? It's been dropping throughout the fall, but not just overly fast. Yeah. Okay. It's so been kind of a slow decline. We stayed full pull through what about half of the summer, and, and it started kind of July, slow. At least till July. Yeah, it's just kind of from July to now, it's kind of slowly dropped to about two and a half foot low is where we're at now. And the temperature's dropped how much this past week? Oh, probably at least 10 degrees. Well, I can tell you, this afternoon... It was, it was like 73 to 75, 76 a, a week ago, like a week Tuesday. and a half ago. We had a front blow in last Wednesday or Thursday, was it? Yeah. So right, right before that, the water was around 75, 73, 76 in there. And right now it's you know low 60s, so 65.3 today. Two weeks ago. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of those fish, and they were so far back in the creek they can't leave that fast. I mean they can, but they're not going to leave that fast. So there's still going to be a lot of fish shallow, but what they're going to do is suck out yeah. to creek channels, drains, low spots within that shallow water, it's and mainly 10 degrees. It's a whole nother ballgame. And, and here's the other thing about those shallow fish, they're more in shock than the deeper fish are. Yeah because their water temperatures are changing more drastically than the deeper fish. There are fish in like really deep water. It's mostly other species of fish. There's some bass out there. I haven't seen a whole lot. I just, I haven't seen a whole lot of, of bass in real deep water um, so far this fall. Now I think in about a week, you know, actually another probably three or four or five days, we will have a whole lot of fish. Well, our normal fall amount of schools will be out deeper. This is gonna push them out there. So they're probably hitting the channels and heading out. Pretty much, they're starting to work. Yeah, some of the ones that are going to make their way back out deeper, making their way out deep right now, and then we're going to have some that are just residential shallow. We we have shallow fish throughout the winter here. We really do have a pretty good population of fish that live shallow all winter. Yep. Because it's just not very long of a break. You know, some of those fish, while the water's in the 60s, they're going to stay shallow and feed, feed, feed in the 60 degree water temps, and then we usually carry that into December. Those 60 degree water temps. And then what happens is it gets down into the 50s and maybe the 40s towards the end of December and January. But by the time January comes around, oftentimes we'll warm back up to 60 degrees by February and we get fish spawning in February most years. And so when you're hitting January, you, those fish that are wanting to spawn, if it, they're already pre-spawn. So they never really back all the way out. They kind of go out a little bit in December and then they come right back in in January for the early pre-spawn. So it's kind of a weird deal. There's just not very much of a... Uh, there's not a very sustained winter bite for a pretty good percentage of the fish on Lake Fork. Winter's just not a very long season. Well, I used to fish Fork a bit 30, 35 years ago. Different lake back it, then. It ain't the same thing. There was grass everywhere back then. <laughs> it was go find a high drilling line and get to work back then. Yes, sir. But nothing's the same. I mean, it's... Mm -mm. I would tell you, I'm not, I hate throwing drop shots. My least favorite thing to do on earth on this lake tomorrow, I'd be throwing one dang there all day. I would, I would get into some areas that you felt good about, felt confident in, and, and you know, I mean, I, like, like Court said, they can kind of be anywhere right now. So just find something that suits your eye that you're confident in, because uh, a lake like this has a population of fish where there is fish a little bit of anywhere. Um, but it'd be a fair bet they're starting to move out. Yeah. Well, I, even the ones that aren't moving out they're going to be the hardest ones to catch because they're the ones that are shocked the worst by the cold. Yeah. So if you like to fish docks, find you some docks with some 6 to 10 foot of water on them, 12 foot of water on them. Um, if you like to fish main lake points, do get out in 12, 15 foot, 10 foot of water on main lake point and, and weld that drop shot to your hand and go slow. Probably the bends and the deep, deeper channels is probably those bass that were there are going to be consistent. Yeah, that's something I do a little bit. For me, I do that a little bit later in the winter. For, for the deeper fish, what I'm finding the deeper fish on this time of year on Lake Fork is usually pond dams and road beds. Way out in the middle of the lake, pond dam and road beds. Uh, just long, narrow, flat areas. It's where the yellow bass tend together, the crappie tend together, and them big bass like to go out there and eat those. 
And so if you're wanting to go out there and try to target the fish that are out deep, I would look to pond dams and road beds is where I look out. I mean, in the slap middle of the lake, far out as you can get sometimes. Um, but there's fish, like I said, there's going to be fish that you can go catch on some timber on May Lake points, on docks, especially if a dock's got a creek channel swing by or something like that, high percentage type of dock. Um, and then, of course, if you want to stay shallow, you can go shallow in the creek arms, just pull out to the creek channel within that shallow water and fish the bends in that. But I think those are going to be the hardest ones to get to bite this weekend with the weather. If it was me and I was going fishing out here tomorrow, I would stay, I would use my electronics a lot on them pond dams and road beds, looking for the deepest schools I could find and trying to find bass mixed in with the yellows and the whites and the crappie and all that. And if I couldn't do that on my graph, then I would go to the mid-depth docks is what I would do. I have a lot of confidence in some mid-depth docks that have, you know, mouths of creeks, good creek channels around them. And I'd take that drop shot and that shaggy head around every dock I could tomorrow. And I'd fish so slow, it'd make, make you hurt. Y'all on the right track? <laughs> hey, that's a good, you know, the thing about a drop shot and a shaky head is, I mean, you can almost do that. You can almost go to mid-depth docks with a yeah. shaky head and a drop shot deep, shallow, year deep. round, and that's going to be your safe bet pattern, you know, for the most part. How you doing? Looks like some David Ozio stuff you're talking about now. Well, you know, <laughs> desperate times call for desperate measures. I'm going to put a jig in my hand. Oh, jig. It's about that time for that jig bite. November, so... I used to always wait to December to start Three throwing a jig a lot. Down real small and compact. And yeah. Just keep it in your hand all day. Mm, I used to always wait to December to throw a jig a lot on Lake Fork. And then the late, great Mark Pack told me one year, he's like, nah, man, nah, you messing up. You need to pick that jig up in November. November is the time. So it is. It's time to start throwing that jig. And, and the original state record caught out of this lake was caught the week before Thanksgiving by Mark Stevenson, 17, whatever it was, 1765, I think, uh, was caught in a Creek Channel Bend on a jig in November. The last share lunker that was caught by a guide customer was in Lee Livesey's boat before he was on the Elite Series about five years ago now, maybe, somewhere, give or take a year, and it was caught on a jig in November. So it's, it is, if you're a jig fisherman, it's the time to start picking it up. Is water color staying about the same, or is it? It's pretty normal right now. Yeah. This is this is pretty standard Lake Fork water. Turnovers done. Mm -hmm. All the muck from the turnovers gone. Okay. Uh, you get in the backs of creeks where we've had some rain here recently. You're going to see some churned up water. That's just normal. That's normal year round stuff on Lake Fork. We get rain. The backs of creeks turn up a little bit, but the main lake, mid lake, mouths of creeks, clear. all looks about just good, yeah. solid Lake Fork water. That's kind of what we have. That's about as clear as we get around here. It gets a little bit clearer from time to time. This is like pretty normal. Even in the backs, of the backs of some of them creeks, I went in this afternoon and they were pretty clean. I mean, water be like a foot and a half, two yeah. foot deep, and you can see the bottom pretty well. So coming from you, call it, you can see a foot deep. That's yeah, that's a different deal. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. You follow Lake in Oklahoma is a muddy yeah. sucker. <laughs> not really. I drove over it a couple of times. It's, you say not really because you're from Oklahoma. You're used to that. And I've fished you follow probably two thousand days of my life. It's muddy. No, really. If you go up on the north end, north of I-40. It's muddier than that. No, you follow it looks just like this right now, I guarantee you. You go down Porham and the Narrows, Narrows yeah. is probably three foot clean. There's clear areas along town, Porham's going to be clear. So they told there. you. If you go up the line. Dude, I don't even, I can't even. <laughs> I know that plays like the back of my hand. I can't even spell the areas you're saying right now. Exactly. Okay. What did he say? He said, you can drag a coon like you, you can walk across the water. It's so thick up there. Hey, this is 2021, sir. You can't talk like that. <laughs> raccoon. Oh, a raccoon. Okay. Okay. We hey. were on the same page. Hey. You were in left field. Sir, this is 2021. We got to be careful. <laughs> no, it's like blood red muddy. No, I've heard, I've heard up, that. Up on that north end. I've heard that about you following the light. Part of the lake is like you can't see nothing, and the upper yeah. lake is actually pretty clear. I've heard that. Yeah, it's pretty clean. But How much like is the water first, down out here now? what's that? How much is the water down right? About two and a half feet. Really? Yeah. yeah. I know it's because Lake Fork's, you know, Lake Fork is more of a flatter lake, uh, and in all of our lakes in this area, more flatter lakes. And so when you lose two and a half feet of height, boy, in some areas, it's it's a long way this width wise, you know. Well, that and from the springtime, we were actually up in the spring. Over full, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like you know, like we were about we foot high in the spring. Six inches to a foot above full pool a lot of the spring this yeah. year. Yeah. Yep. So, Any other? so yeah, it looks worse. <laughs> Any other questions? No. 
Well, hey, man, I sure appreciate all you guys coming out. JJ, I ain't, you ain't said a word per the usual for you, man. It's good to see you again, though, buddy. Yeah. Hey, thank you guys. We want to thank Lake Fork Marina. Please do go down and spend some money with them, buy some tackle. Uh, they don't charge us a dime to let us come up here and take over their facilities every two weeks. And we really, really appreciate them and firmly believe, uh, really glad that they let us do it because this is the best lodging, staying, launching yeah. facility on the lake, boat ramps, tackle store, restaurant, hotel, yeah. cabins. I mean, everything you want right here at Lake Fork Marine. We really appreciate them for everything they've done for us. So thank you guys, and we'll be right back here in two weeks.